Whether attracting data analysts at the start of dot-com era or broadening the routes into healthcare professions, these are always a challenge. We're bolstering teacher numbers through the highest pay award for 30 years, providing generous bursaries worth up to £27,000 and are levelling up premium worth up to £3,000 a year each year for the five years for maths, physics, chemistry and computing teachers. Beth Winter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The National Foundation for Education Research says today, and I quote, a strategy for improving recruitment and retention should involve pay uplifts that are higher than pay growth in the wider labour market for most or all teachers. Does the Secretary of State agree, and is it not the case she cannot address this crisis until she gives teachers and support staff the fully funded inflation plus pay rise they deserve? Yeah. Thank you. I thank the Honourable Lady for, for her question. In 2019, we actually launched the Government's first ever integrated strategy to recruit and retrain more uh, teachers in schools. And this had a number of different strands in it, including supporting teachers on the way in, recruiting more, various routes into teaching. And of course, we have an independent pay review body. And this year, we did fully accept all of their recommendations in full. Sir David Evans. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Friday morning, I was privileged to attend St Paulina's School in Crayford in my constituency to speak with teachers and also to answer pupils' questions. An inspirational teacher, as my right-on friend knows, is often the key to opening opportunities to young people for their future. What more can the government do to help retain more of these good, aspirational teachers? I uh, thank the honourable, uh, my honourable friend for, for his work, and I'm sure, uh, like many of us, we have uh, our treat on a Friday when we all get to go into our fantastic schools and uh, meet with uh, lots of children. The Early Careers Framework is really focused, it's just been introduced actually last year, and it's really focused on trying to make sure that we support teachers, particularly in the first five years, to make sure that we retain more teachers. The figures show that the risk of retention is actually in the first um, you know, naught to five years, so we're, we put a lot of work and effort into making sure that we support teachers more during that period. Ian Blackfield. Of course, recruitment and retention of uh, teachers is important, but all of us in this House will prioritise keeping school children safe from sexual predators, and I'm sure the Minister will be aware of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry detailing the horrific allegations from a number of witnesses to events at Edinburgh Academy and Fetish School by an individual referred to as Edgar. I have a number of constituents who have complaints against Edgar. This man has admitted to inappropriate behaviour and is currently fighting extradition from South Africa, where he has been publicly named. There is precedence in England where another alleged abuser living in South Africa whose extradition has been sought has been publicly named. We now know that there are dozens of boys who have come forward to the police with allegations against this man referred to as Edgar. It is important that others who were abused by this man can come forward. It is right that his crimes against children are named, and it is also right that he is now named. It is for this reason, Mr Speaker, that it is in the public interest that the real name of Edgar, that is Ian Wares, is now publicly known. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I thank the honourable gentleman. Child sexual abuse is an abhorrent crime, and the government is sympathetic to the victims and survivors of such abuse. As set out in November in response to the final report of the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, it is important that due process is followed, allowing investigatory and legal processes to take place in order to maximise the chances of conviction. Philip Oliver. The State confirmed that the Government is intending to raise starting salaries for teachers to £30,000 a year, yep. and that the pension entitlement that teachers enjoy is far higher than those earning the same wage in the private sector. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, yes, my honourable friend makes a very good point. It, it was a manifesto commitment to raise the starting salaries. Um, it is £28,000 this year, and it will be £30,000 next year, from September next year, um, uh, in line with our manifesto commitment. And yes, I can confirm that the teachers' pension contribution, the employers' Uh, contribution is 23.6%, I think, so it is uh, considerably higher than many in the private sector. Dear Meg Hillier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State says she wants to support teachers, particularly in the first five years, and the £30,000 a year is kicking in next year. But in London, five years is often about the time that people have to move because they simply cannot afford to rent privately or buy in the capital. What yeah. is she doing to look at this, both in the immediate term and in the long term, to make sure that we keep good teachers in London? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, I think the Honourable uh, Lady may be aware, but we do have a, a London waiting uh, for, for teachers. And, uh, but, of course, the cost of accommodation in London, I do accept, are extremely uh, high in some areas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And it is indeed a treat to visit schools. And on Friday, I visited the brilliant Horndean Technology College, where I was told that there are 20 ways of getting into teaching, but still schools are struggling to get teachers. So what more can we do to slim down the, the, those 20 ways, which does seem rather a lot, and ensure that we have well-qualified teachers to teach pupils to a high standard? One of the main things we're doing, I thank my honourable friend for, for her question, is uh, to make sure that we have bursaries to attract uh, teachers in particular, particularly those subjects where there's a lot of competition for those skills. Um, and I, I actually am hoping to uh, actually increase the routes because we are looking to have um, an apprenticeship for teaching at undergraduate uh, so that people who won't need to earn and learn can also uh, be attracted into teaching. Senator so Stephen Moore. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Having dumped the schools bill, the only edu education policy this government seems to have is a gimmick announcement on making maths compulsory until 18, a plan that experts say is unachievable in light of the teacher recruitment crisis. What discussion did the Secretary of State have with the Prime Minister before his announcement? Because surely they would have told him it was unworkable, given that the government has missed its recruitment target for maths teachers in each of the last 10 years. Yeah. So we have a, a very a, much a focus on, on, on making sure that our standards are very high in school and making sure that our children have the very best education so that they compete globally when they need to get into the workforce. Now, if you look at every other developed economy, pretty much all of them, their children do maths of some form up to the age of 18, and we're a bit of an outlier. So what we're doing is looking to raise the expectations and standards to make sure that our children can compete and also give them skills for life as well with financial. Now, of course, we will work with the sector, and it is a, a, a longer-term strategy to make sure that we do have enough maths teachers. We do have a number of uh, strategies already in place because it is always tough to uh, recruit maths teachers, but that's why we have introduced a bursary of up to £27,000 uh, for all maths teachers and also many science teachers. Mary McCarthy. Question three, Mr. Speaker. With permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll answer questions three and ten together. All children, no matter their special educational need or disability, deserve the right support to be able to succeed. We will be publishing a full response to the SEND AP Green Paper in an improvement plan early this year, and we continue to work closely with children, families, and education, health care, and local government sectors on this very important issue. Colonel McCarthy. Today is Blue Monday, and I'm sure both you, Mr Speaker, and the Education Secretary will be pleased to know that following the event we did last year, the band New Order and the charity Calm have teamed up together today to urge people not to hold back from seeking help with their mental health if they need it. But as we discussed at that event, too many children are facing unconscionable delays in getting assessed and in getting support. Too many children risk being damaged for life as a result. So can the Minister please get a move on and bring forward the response to the SEND review consultation? Children shouldn't have to wait any longer. I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. I can assure her we're working incredibly hard and we'll be publishing a response imminently. In the meantime, we are rolling out training on mental health for all schools across the country, and I'm working very hard with my counterparts at Health to make sure that when we look at the proposals on SEND, that they are brought fully into the picture as well. David Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have many local parents in Oxfordshire who are unhappy with the County Council for a variety of reasons, from emails that are never answered to EHCPs that come back with details about the wrong child on them or just long delays in receiving the EHCP. My honourable friend will know many parents want this as it's become the only way to get support for their children where they might have been able to get support at an earlier stage from school and that not be necessary. Can she tell us what steps she's taking to address this? Yeah. Well, I know my honourable friend has raised this issue with me several times, and one of the key parts of the reforms that the SEND Green Paper will set out is clear standards for what help children with different SEND needs should be getting in school, because that will give parents greater transparency and accountability in what their child should reasonably get, but it also means those children will get the early help that my honourable friend so rightly talks about. Ben Bradshaw. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. She will be aware that Devon Children's Services has been failing now for many years, with special educational needs being a particular problem. Following the latest inspector's damning report, the County Council has belatedly appointed a new head of Children's Services. But will she make absolutely clear to the political leadership of Devon County Council that if things don't improve quickly, she will have no hesitation in stripping Devon of its responsibility for children's services? Uh, I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman for his question. We do work with all areas who are struggling to provide SEND through our regions group work, through our Delivering Better Value programmes and our safety valve programmes. So I will, of course, look at this issue very carefully and we always step in and act when we need to. Jonathan Gillis. Thank you. Mr Speaker, one of the best ways that young people with SEND can be supported is by remaining in the local area to be educated. That's why I'm delighted, thanks to a significant amount of government investment, that Middlehurst School, which is currently sitting empty, is now being built to create 80 new SEND school places. Will my honourable friend congratulate Councillor Janine Bridges and Stoke on Trent City Council for this amazing work and pleasure to come open it when it's ready, hopefully, at the end of this year? Here, here. Well, I will absolutely commend the work of Councillor Janine Bridges, who sounds like she's doing a tremendous job to increase the number of places for SEND children. And I'd be delighted to come in and see whether I can open it as well. Robin Walker. A question four, please, Mr Speaker. I know how important childcare is uh, to the Chair, and I look forward to seeing his committee's report on this. Getting this right is fundamentally important for parents and children, and my honourable friend, the Minister for Children, Families and Wellbeing, is looking at all options to improve the cost, flexibility and availability of childcare, and, crucially, outcomes for children. It may interest the members opposite that, since 2010, we have doubled Labour's offer from 15 hours to 30 hours of free childcare for four, three- to four-year-olds. We have also introduced 15 hours free childcare a week uh, for disadvantaged two-year-olds, and parents on universal credit can claim back up to 85% of their childcare costs. Well, I'm Walker. grateful to the Secretary of State for that answer, and she's right to set out what has been uh, achieved. But as she will recognise, the issue of access to affordable and high-quality childcare is high on the agenda of parents and of members right across this House, and it's something that, uh, as she's recognised, the Select Committee are looking into. Uh, there has been much speculation in the media as to whether this remains a priority for the government. Can she reassure me and the committee that she does plan further reform and investment in this space? I thank my honourable friend for his question, and I can reassure him and uh, the whole House that childcare is important to this government. I met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on this actually only last week. Helping working families to take up childcare and remain in work is a government priority, and we've also taken some steps to make sure this happens. And we also want to make sure that people are going to benefit from a lot of the schemes that we have in place, as some of them are underutilised. So we do have a £1.2 million childcare choices campaign to increase. Uh, the usage of those. But we will go further and we are looking at all options to improve the affordability and availability of childcare and, crucially, outcomes for children. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Sadly, childcare is not the only thing that parents are struggling to afford to pay for. And I'm very grateful to Karen Taylor from Rooted in Hull for drawing to my attention the work done by the Child Poverty Action Group on poverty-proofing schools. And what this does is provides a toolkit for schools to look at their academic year and to identify times when they're asking parents to pay money and then to try to find ways to alleviate this and reduce the cost to parents. So will the Secretary of State join me in encouraging many schools up and down the country, academy chains and head teachers to have a look at this toolkit and do what they can to reduce the costs associated with sending their child to school. Yeah. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. And of course, we're always focused on what more we can do. We obviously have people premium funding, but we also have school uniform guidance. Obviously, we have the highest number of uh, children benefiting from free school meals as well, and in deprived areas, breakfast clubs, which we have introduced. Uh, but of course, we all know that um, economically times are tough, which is why we're very much focused on trying to get inflation down and the Prime Minister's pledge to halve inflation uh, this year. Shadow Minister Helen Hayes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Childcare is essential social infrastructure which underpins our economy by supporting parents to work. Yet in 2022, more than 5,000 childcare providers closed and more than half of all local authority areas saw a net loss of childcare places. The Government has admitted that they pay providers less than it costs them to deliver the so-called free childcare places, and with energy bills and wages going up from April, many more providers are at risk of closure. 
There is a crisis in our early years sector happening right now. Yeah. What is the government going to do to stop further childcare providers from closing? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I thank the Honourable Lady for a question. Actually, Ofsted data shows that the number of childcare places um, has uh, remained broadly stable at 1.3 million since August 2015. But at the spending review uh, 2021, we announced additional funding of £160 million in 2023, and £180 million in 2023 24, and £170 million 24 25. And that's compared to uh, the 2021 22 financial year. And this will allow local authorities to increase hourly rates paid to childcare providers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Number five. We are transforming people's lives, uh, life chances, by enabling them to climb the education skills ladder of opportunity. And on the 9th of January this year, we announced that in financial year 2023-24, we will increase funding rates to invest a further £125 million in 16 to 19 education. 18.5 million pounds in 16 to 19 education has been invested in institutions that cover the constituency of Waveney. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. I'm most grateful for, to my right hon. Friend for that answer. But taking into account <coughs> both the urgent need to address acute skills shortages in key sectors of the economy and the fact that ad participation in adult education has fallen from 4.4 million in 2003-2004 to 1.5 million in 2019-2020, it is vital that the capacity of further education is significantly expanded. My right hon. Friend, the Chancellor, highlighted the importance of investment in skills in his autumn statement. I would be grateful if my right hon. Friend could set out the work that has been done to meet this challenge ahead of the spring statement. Well, my my hon. Friend is, is an FE champion, and I welcome his question. And he will be pleased to know uh, that we're investing in resources, increasing skills funding by 3.6 billion over this uh, parliament, investing in quality qualifications like T-levels, higher technical qualifications, free level three courses, boot camps and apprenticeships, and investing in infrastructure as well, rolling out 21 Institutes of Technology. Come on, my old friend. Uh, he can do better than that. The fact of the matter is, still, Further education in our country is a Cinderella service. When will you wake up to the fact that we need more skilled people in our country, we need them desperately, and the FE sector is the one area that you could actually do the real investment that pays back very quickly? Can I urge the Minister, who I like a lot, we're old friends, get his act together and put some real heft into uh, further education? Um, when the Honourable Gentleman say, uh, describes FE as the Cinderella sector, I might to remind you that uh, Cinderella became a member of the royal family. <laughs> and, 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 and it's this government, it's, it's, yeah. it's this government that is banishing the two ugly sisters of under-resourcing and snobbery about further education oh, yeah. and skills. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And as I said, as I said to, uh, uh, in my previous answer to my Honourable Friend, we're investing at 3.6 extra, 3.6 billion extra uh, in skills in this parliament, 3.8 billion I should say, 1.6 billion extra for uh, FE, increasing the number of hours students learn. I'm very proud of this government's approach to further education and skills. Right, let us move to Shadow Minister Toby Perkins. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I mean, the Minister uh, was a huge champion for the FE sector um, when he was the Select Committee Chair, so it will be depressing to hear that he's now speaking up for this government. This government's funding settlements for FE colleges are the worst in post-war history. Not my view, the view of the Independent Institute, Institute for Fiscal Studies. Their analysis exposes that per student funding fell 14 per cent in real terms between 2010 and 2019. Isn't the reality that after 13 years of this government, it's only the election of a Labour government that will allow our colleges to play the role that we truly need from them. <laughs> so I say to my honourable friend, uh, uh, it's wishful thinking on his, his part. I mean, the, 
the government is increasing investment in apprenticeships to 2.7 billion by 2024-25. We'll be investing an extra 1.6 billion in 16 to 19 education at the same period of time. That includes 500 million a year for T levels. I mentioned the 290 million pounds that's being spent on Institute of Technologies and uh, 1.5 billion pounds to commit and upgrade uh, FE College of State in England over the next few years. So this is a government that's investing in championing uh, further education and skills, and my honourable friend should recognise that. Clerk. Number six, please, Mr Speaker. As set out in our Send and Alternative Provision Green Paper published in March, uh, our ambitious alternative provision reforms will equip all children in AP with the right support in the right setting at the right time. Our reforms will enable children with behaviour that present barriers to learning or medical needs to have the support, skills and confidence needed to thrive. Rob Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm grateful to my honourable friend for that answer. Many of the children I've met in the youth justice system have been excluded from mainstream schools and instead sent to alternative provision, where often the standards are very good, but sadly that is far from always the case. Indeed, the Youth Justice Board, on which I used to sit, said an improvement in standards and practice is needed across alternative provision. So what action is the Minister taking to make sure that alternative provision isn't a dumping ground for difficult pupils that mainstream schools want to exclude, and that, by contrast, it's high-quality teaching and welfare support that is always the case in AP? Minister. Well, I thank my honourable friend. I know he's a passionate uh, believer in youth justice. In fact, I think the first time we met, that's what we were, were speaking about. And he is right to be concerned about this area. We know there are some great AP settings. Indeed, I was talking to Mark Vickers of Olive Academies recently. But we know that some settings are delivering very poor outcomes for young people. I really am excited about our proposals on AP. I think they will be transformational. I'll be happy to discuss them further with the, with the honourable member. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Funding for alternative provision for children who are unwell peters out after the age of 16. There was no mention in last November's budget of, of colleges. I've got a constituent in Devon whose uh, mother I spoke to this morning. The son has been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and is unable to get the online tuition that he needs uh, from, from our local college. So I, I wonder. When might colleges receive the additional revenue funding so that they might be able to afford the alternative provision for children diagnosed with illnesses like my constituent? So, uh, as part of the reforms that we're setting out, we'll be developing a bespoke national alternative framework that will include uh, looking at standards, looking at sustainable post-16 destinations, and I'd be happy to discuss with the honourable gentleman further once we've published our proposals. So, the on part. Mr. Speaker. With permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 7 and 22 together. Family hubs are one-stop shops that make it easier for families to get the support they need, and I strongly support them. The Government is investing £300 million in the Start for Life and Family Hubs programme, and 75 local authorities will begin to open hubs later this year. Thank you, Mr Speaker. East Sussex County Council submitted an excellent bid for a network of family hubs across East Sussex, and we know that family hubs are a part of the solution to many national and local issues and are vitally lead in, needed in, in many of our local communities more, now more than ever. In addition to the rollout of family hubs, what steps is my right honourable friend taking to ensure that this fantastic policy has long-term funding to maximise long-term benefits? Here, here. Here, here. I thank my honourable friend for her question, and I strongly agree with my uh, honourable friend. We are funding 75 councils for the current spending review period, and I have no doubt that the excellent work in East Sussex, led by Becky Shaw and her excellent team, and across the country, will make the case for further investment. Robert Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of the work this government is doing with family hubs, early years, and start to life. Um, in Wales, each seeking to give babies and young people. Uh, children the very best start to life. In, in Wales, uh, every community has a kilch maithrin, uh, an informal group of mothers, babies and young children. It's a tradition almost in Wales of care within the community. But the more formal uh, support for the early years is more variable across Wales. I wonder, does the minister, could the minister tell me what arrangements there are for sharing or exchanging these best, best practices with the Welsh Government on important areas such as this? 
Uh, I thank the Honourable Friend for his question. Um, we do have regular meetings, actually, with all of the devolved um, uh, authorities, and we do share ideas as well of what we're doing and different policies, so that we can learn from each other. And uh, we, could, you know, there's, there's no uh, monopoly on good ideas. We're always uh, open to listening and sharing. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, yeah. since the publication of the Independent Review into Children's Social Services, which also will uh, improve the use of family hubs, hundreds of children have been taken into care, while millions of profit have been put out into the private sector. Yeah. So when is she going to publish the government's delayed response to this review? And will she look at York being a pilot to ensure that we can move this forward quickly? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question, and uh, I just want to assure that this is work that we are. My Honourable Friend, uh, the uh, Minister for Children's Families and Wellbeing, is, is, is working very actively on, and it will be published very soon. And I'm sure that my Honourable Friend will be happy to discuss further how we will roll that out and implement it. Theresa Billis. Question number eight, Mr. Speaker, sir. Maintain nursery schools make an invaluable contribution to improving the lives of disadvantaged children. We are investing an additional £10 million into their supplementary funding from 2023-24, taking the total around £70 million, and reforming the distribution of this funding to make it fairer, ensuring all authorities with maintain nursery schools receive supplementary funding. Can I warmly welcome that extra funding because it means that for the first time maintain nursery schools in Barnet get a share of this supplementary funding. So Will she join me in welcoming this funding and will she express her strong support for the maintained nursery school sector in the future? Well, I thank my right honourable friend. I know she has consistently and passionately campaigned uh, for the maintained nursery school sector. And I agree they're doing an excellent job, not only in supporting some of the most disadvantaged children, but also in sharing their expertise and knowledge with other providers as well. Speaker, in my Bath constituency, Midford Rose. The Midford Road Nursery was sadly forced to close its doors. The sta staff shortage is the major reason why they had to close, and many nurseries in Bath face similar problems, and parents struggle to find, find alternatives. What advice would the Minister give to parents in Bath who struggle to find a nursery? Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. We have actually, in terms of early years, increased funding by about half a billion pounds set out since 2021. I do agree that workforce is an issue, and we're looking at recruitment and retention very carefully, uh, and we'll be setting out as proposals as, as and when we can. James Wilde. Yeah. Number nine, please, Mr Speaker. Yeah. With permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 9 and 15 together. In December, I announced a further 239 schools that will benefit from large-scale rebuilding and refurbishment projects as part of our school rebuilding programme, which will transform 500 schools across the country. I saw the huge impacts our investments have in at Cowden Court School, where I met Mr Heal, a head teacher, and his students that were very excited at the prospect of their new classrooms and design and tech and science labs. Mr Speaker, as Conservatives, we are not only investing in the next generation future, but of that of generations to come. On top of this, we have allocated over £13 billion to improve in school buildings since 2015, including £1.8 billion this year. Thank you. I welcome the recent addition of the King Edward VII Academy to the rebuilding programme, following the inclusion of Smithton High School in an earlier round and the new investment that is coming to North West Norfolk. However, can my honourable friend, right honourable friend, assure me that given Smithton's grade two star listed status and the complexity that that brings, that the funding for that school is protected? And will ministers meet me to ensure that we get the heritage and other permissions we need as rapidly as possible? I thank Honourable Friend for his question. My department is working closely with heritage and planning officers to ensure that we can address the condition of Smithton High as quickly as possible, whilst recognising the listed uh, status of the buildings. We are working on the project with Historic England and the 20th Century Society, and would be very happy to provide the Honourable Member to meet with him and to provide an update on progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, in Hamburg and Hasenden, we received the fantastic news just before Christmas that Hamburg Academy and Hasenden High School will be included in the next yeah, round of the yeah, school's yeah, rebuilding yeah. programme. And I eagerly await the next round so schools in my patch, like the Hollins, can apply. Can my right honourable friend confirm whether schools rebuilding programme funding could be used in conjunction with other investment for initiatives that not only benefit the school but the wider community as well? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Honourable Friend, for an excellent question. Um, we do encourage role, uh, schools to play a positive role in their communities, which may, with many choosing to provide access to sports and other facilities. The school rebuilding programme directly commissions projects rather than providing funding to schools, so where feasible we include additional facilities beyond the scope of a project, and if it's funded uh, by the local trust or the local authority. Um, but we are interested in making sure that school facilities do benefit the wider community. Laurie Vars. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Right Honourable Member for Bognor Regis visited Joseph Lecky and that really helped. I had a good meeting with the heads of Joseph Lecky and Blue Coat Academy with my friend, the Honourable Member for Worcester, <coughs> but they've still lost yeah. out. Will the Secretary of State or one of her ministers meet with me and the heads of those two schools <laughs> to find out why on earth they cannot be successful in getting funding for these vital repairs? Um, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. Yes, we'd be very happy to, to meet, and obviously there are some schools that are disappointed that they didn't get access to this funding, but uh, we have now announced 400 schools uh, so far, but there are still another 100 in future rounds as well, but we'd be very happy to meet with her. Vera Wilson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A Schools Week investigation found at least 40 schools contain so-called aero-concrete, and a further 150 need further investigation. Officials described uh, the concrete as life expired and liable to collapse, which is extremely alarming. Now, NHS England says that it will take until 2035 to remove this aero concrete from all our hospitals. Will we be waiting as long as that for our schools as well? I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. The Government published updated guidance on identifying and managing re reinforced um, aerated concrete last year. In March 22, all schools were asked to complete a questionnaire about the knowledge of RAC, its presence in their buildings, and if they have it, how they're managing it. Where the presence of RAC is confirmed, we help um, with those schools with the appropriate technical support, and we are looking to make sure that we uh, continue that programme. Daniel Kortinsky. The question 11, sir. Um, many schools and colleges already mark Holocaust Memorial Day. I've attended such a remembrance service in Harlow College. And uh, this is all the more important. They work closely with the Holocaust Memorial Trust and the Holocaust Educational Trust, two institutions that the government give, uh, give support. This is all the more important given that uh, there were 128 incidents of anti-Semitism in our higher education institutions. Uh, that's sadly at an all-time high. No. I'd like to thank my honourable friend for that answer. Can I ask him that in addition to educating children about the horrors of the Holocaust and the Second World War, can we also take the opportunity uh, to educate children about the tremendous courage and bravery and sacrifices of the righteous among nations. Many people on the continent gave up their lives to protect their Jewish friends and neighbours. And one example is a member of my family, Jan Kavczynski, his wife Helena, and their 13-year-old daughter Magdalena, all shot by the Germans for protecting and hiding their Jewish friends and neighbours on their estate in Western Poland. As well as educating children about the misery of the Holocaust, we must give them inspiration that many of our brothers and sisters in occupied Europe gave the ultimate sacrifice to protect friends and neighbours of the Jewish faith. Hear, hear, hear. I'd have to say it's very moving to hear of your family's experience, and I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. We must teach and remind people that there were many righteous Gentiles who suffered doing everything possible to save uh, Jews. And if I can mention another famous Polish lady, Irene Sendler, who saved 2,000 Jewish children from the Warsaw ghettos and uh, was remembered in a special exhibition in Parliament in the Commons in 2018, of which I was pleased to attend. But my uh, Honourable Friend makes a really powerful point, and I'm sure schools up and down the country will be listening to what he says. To number 12, Mr Speaker. Thank you. We're improving uh, quality in apprenticeships. To, Ofsted will be uh, inspecting every apprenticeship provider by 2025. All providers have been asked to re-register with the Register of Providers. Uh, we're intervening to help apprentices uh, and employers as well. 
Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Miss, uh, my local college, Eastleigh College, work alongside 700 regional employers to deliver high-quality apprenticeships right through to degree level. Last year, nearly a third of apprenticeship starts were higher level. So, can I ask what steps the government is taking to broaden the routes into technical education and increase the number of higher-level apprenticeship starts? Yeah. Question. He will be pleased to know there have been over uh, 10,800 apprenticeship starts uh, in his constituency since 2010. We're investing £2.7 billion in apprenticeships by uh, 2025. We're spending uh, some of that £8 million on degree, promoting degree level apprenticeships. We have a big uh, recruitment campaign, Fire It Up, to try and encourage more apprentices. We're uh, transforming careers advice on apprenticeships in schools uh, in schools and colleges and of course we pay non-levy pair small businesses the vast majority of their training costs when they hire apprenticeships Good. question 13 mr speaker thank you mr speaker the law is clear that schools must prohibit the promotion of partisan uh, political views and should take steps to ensure the balanced presentation of opposing views on political issues when these are being taught. Guidance to schools on political impartiality was published in February 2022. Uh, it uh, summarises the legal position and makes it clear that steps taken to ensure these legal duties are met should be reasonable and proportionate. Real case. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You don't have to be a historian to understand the dangers of indoctrinating children. And yet polling by YouGov for policy exchange shows that the majority of UK children are being taught political ideology as fact in school. For example, gender ideology, which states that children can be born in the wrong body and men can have babies, or critical race theories that say race is a social construct, or sex positivity, such as in this document, which instructs children of ch uh, teachers of children with learning disabilities to simulate sexual arousal on anatomically correct dolls while playing sexy music in class. These are not isolated incidents, but endemic in our schools. The guidance is not working. What does the Minister intend to do about it? Uh, the guidance on uh, political impartiality does make it very clear that when teaching about sensitive political issues relating to discrimination, uh, teachers should be mindful to avoid promoting partisan views or presented, presenting uh, contested theories as fact. Schools need to ensure that any resources used in the classroom, particularly if they have been produced by an external organisation, are age-appropriate, suitable and politically impartial. And schools should consult parents uh, and they should share lesson materials uh, when parents are to see them. Zora Question 14, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Government supports the provision of nutritious food in schools, which ensures children are well nourished develop healthy eating habits and can concentrate and learn. 1.9 million pupils are eligible for free school meals. That's an increase from 2021, when 1.7 million pupils were eligible. In large part, the increase is due to protections put in place to support families as they move to universal credit. In addition, of course, 1.25 million pupils are eligible under the Universal Infant Free School Meal Programme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Each month, four million children experience food insecurity, going to bed hungry, and then setting off to school on an empty stomach. To tackle this injustice, my free school meals for all bill would guarantee that every child in England would get a hot, healthy meal each day, just as being done in Scotland and Wales. It could be paid for twice over by removing the private school's £1.7 billion tax break, a move that the party opposite blocked last week. My bill is due to get its second reading on Friday. So I asked the minister, will he back my bill, or does he believe that pa protecting tax breaks for elite private schools is more important than feeding hungry children? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, we, the government has extended uh, free school meals to more groups of children than any other government over the past century, including uh, Labour governments in that period. So there was an increase, as I've said earlier, from 1.7 million to 1.9 million. Uh, there's an extension to 85,000 students in FE colleges introduced by this government. And there's new eligibility for some children of families with no recourse to public funds. And of course, the 1.25 million children in infant schools, again, another scheme introduced by this government. Some peace votes, Bertrand Carole Mr Speaker, the Leveling Up Secretary said in October that extending free school meal provision would be the most timely, effective and targeted of all public health interventions that this government could make. 
The Scottish Government has already committed to universal free school meals for primary children. Does the Minister agree with his colleague? And if not, what targeted interventions would he make to tackle child hunger? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are spending £1.6 billion a year on uh, free school meals for children. and We do want to make sure that those that funding is targeted at the most needy, and that's precisely uh, what is happening. We accept the point, and I agree with the Honourable Lady, that it is important that children from disadvantaged backgrounds, children that can't afford uh, free, uh, lunch, uh, meals at lunchtime, that they are provided. But we are doing so. As I've said, we've increased the number of children eligible for free school meals, that is related free school meals, from 1.7 million to 1.9 million pupils. Don't mind, you sing, Desi. Uh, 16, please, Mr Speaker. First day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Schools like families and businesses across the world are facing global inflationary pressures. The Prime Minister has pledged to halve inflation and school funding will increase by £2 billion next year, as well as the year after that. This will be the highest real terms spending on schools in history, totalling £58.8 billion by 2024 25. In 2010, school funding stood at £35 billion, so we will be delivering a 68% increase in cash terms. The Government has also announced further support for parents worth £26 billion next year. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, in addition to grave concerns about recruiting and retaining teachers, schools in Slough and across our country continue to struggle with their budgets, with a quarter of primary school senior leaders reporting that they have had to cut outings and trips due to budgetary constraints. So, Secretary of State, how will the government ensure that children do not miss out on these vital opportunities? Um, the autumn, uh, I thank the Honourable uh, Gentleman for his question. The autumn statement announced a significant additional investment in core schools funding. The score, core schools budget will increase by £2 billion, as I have just pointed out, in 2023 24 and 2024 25. That will be paid into schools' um, bank accounts in April, so I am sure that they will uh, welcome the, that additional funding. Elaine. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Department's own report now reclassifies. 17. 17. 17. 17. Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Two schools uh, in Northumberland are prioritised for the school rebuilding programme, including uh, Ringway Primary School in the Honourable Member's constituency. Schools were nominated by local authorities and trusts and selected according to the conditions, condition of their buildings following a robust assessment process. This is in addition to the £5.8 million of school condition allocation funding for Northumberland County Council in this financial year. In Labour. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Department's own report now reclassifies a risk of school building collapsing as, as critical, very urgent. And despite the sterling efforts of head teachers and staff to keep school buildings in decent conditions, many children in my constituency are taught in buildings far below the standards they should expect. Can the Minister, despite what he's just said, can the Minister tell the House when adequate funding will be made readily available to bring all schools in my constituency up to scratch? Yeah. 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 Well, we, we've allocated £13 billion since 2015 on school building and maintenance. In May 2022, for example, the Government announced the outcome of the Condition Improvement Fund bids for 2022-23. That will provide £500 million for 1,400 projects at 1,100 schools and sixth forms. The CIF uh, is for individual schools and the groups of schools. In addition, £1.1 billion of school condition allocations was made to local authorities and large groups of academies. We take this issue very seriously. We want to make sure that all our schools are in the best possible condition for pupils to be able to learn. Number 18, Mr Speaker. My department has made a one-off reallocation of funding to add £15 million uh, to this year's student premium, now worth £276 million. Universities can support disadvantaged students by drawing on the student premium and their own hardship funds. Many universities, like Newcastle and Northumbria, have allocated funds to support disadvantaged students. Newcastle University's Students' Union's recent cost of living crisis survey revealed that 41% of students have considered dropping out due to financial pressures. They're trying to balance studying with part and full time jobs, They're increasingly isolated and exhausted. And the Student Union Food Bank, which is restocked daily, is emptied quickly, the record being within seven minutes. Now, he knows that his 
is additional hardship fund works out, I think, £10 per student, and they're leaving students are £1,500 worse off because of the mismanagement of maintenance loans. So why are you punishing students like that? Yeah, yeah. Of course, I recognise that some students are facing hardships with the cost of living uh, challenges, like many people up and down the, the country. The £276 million is a lot of money that universities can uh, draw on. As I mentioned, it's an increase of £15 million. Students in private accommodation can get a £400 rebate on their energy bills. We've frozen tuition fees for the past few years, and they'll have been frozen by 2024-25 for seven years. We've increased maximum loads and grants by 2.8%. And if students' incomes fall below a certain level, they can reapply to, uh, to get their loans uh, looked at. And I, I really welcome that Newcastle University has increased the package of support available to students to more than £1.7 million. Pounds. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the cost of living crisis we hear is serious for everyone, uh, but for students in particular, they're facing real hardship. I just heard the independent economists est estimate that many students will be up to £1,500 uh, worse off this year. Uh, given the government's current focus on maths, can the minister explain how his government calculated an increase of just 2.8% in the maintenance loan, following 2.3% this year, when the rolling average inflation rate is running at 9.3%. Yeah, yeah. Well, I say to um, the honourable gentleman that we have to be fair to students and fair to the taxpayer as well. So we recognise student hardship. That's why we did increase the, uh, the, the, the student premium to 276 million by 15 million, 15 million pounds. Universities have their own hardship funds. I highlighted the 1.7 million given by Newcastle University. Other universities up and down the country are helping disadvantaged students. And I mentioned that students whose, whose family incomes before, fall before certain levels can reapply to uh, other student loans companies to get their loans reassessed. Right, we come to topical as chum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And special educational. Oh, number one, sorry. Sarah so Sturt. Mr Speaker, given this is my first education questions of 2023, I would like to wish you, the House and all working in our education sector a happy new year and share some of what was to come from my department. Later this month, along with my honourable friend, the Children and Families Minister, I will be announcing our comprehensive plans to reform children's social care. Soon after, we will return to bring forward our transformational improvement plans to support children with special educational needs. In February, I hope members will join me in celebrating National Apprenticeship Week. And in April, our schools will have something to celebrate as they will be receiving their funding, which will include the extra £2 billion uplift announced at the Auden Statement, seeing overall funding rise by 15% in just two years. We are investing more in our schools than ever before. By 2024-25, it will be £58.8 billion, the highest real-term spending in history. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And special educational needs provision in school matters. I have so many parents contacting me because either they can't access it or it's inadequate. One family with two neurodiverse children suffering from bullying and self-harming found that their school's uh, SEND policy did not even mention autism or neurodiversity. So this morning the Minister said that the response to the government's review would be published imminently. Can she confirm that that is within the month and that the clear standards that she measured will be, uh, that she mentioned clear standards, can she confirm they will be enforced? Well, I thank uh, the Honourable Lady for her question. And it is very important. Special educational needs is something I take very seriously, as does the Minister for Children, Families and Wellbeing. Um, it will be very soon. There is not long to wait. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you, will be, uh, you will be delighted with the improvement plan that we will publish, uh, which was early, very early in the new year and not long to wait. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my constituent, uh, Hayley Turner, in our community of North Norfolk, is an inspirational campaigner for special educational uh, needs. Uh, she improves it enormously across our, our whole area. Uh, the evidence shows that early diagnosis and indeed autism interventions is paramount to uh, ensure that children get the help that they need. And Hayley now uses her experience to help many others in the community. Can I ask the Minister just what uh, the Government is doing to help with neurodevelopmental services and also to recruit educational specialists? I suggest that you do know it is a topic. We can't just go on and on. We've got to get through for everyone else's sake. 
Minister. So I commend uh, your constituent, Haley for the work that she does. I do think access to educational psychologists is paramount so you can get that early diagnosis. And we are funding an additional 600, 223, 400 in the year after. Right, let's come to show Secretary State for the Duke Phillips. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Department for Education has raised the risk of school buildings collapsing to critical very likely. And in December, the schools minister undertook to publish the data on these dangerous buildings by the end of the year. Yet parents, staff and pupils are still in the dark. Yeah, yeah. When will the Secretary of State finally publish this data and own up to the extent of her own failure? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As we said, uh, I said earlier, we're spending £13 billion on uh, capital funding in the school system since uh, 2015. We take the safety of schools very seriously. As I said, as the Secretary of State said earlier, uh, regarding uh, uh, reinforced autoclave aerated concrete, we, are, we have written to uh, all schools asking them to complete a questionnaire. Uh, in terms of uh, publishing the data, the Department has already uh, published summary findings from the condition data collection, and we plan to publish uh, more uh, detailed data shortly. The condition data collections help us to understand the condition of schools, and we will publish uh, as and when uh, the data is ready. Second question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No answer, um, even though the schools minister said we would see this data last year. Mr. Speaker, Conservative members opposite have described their childcare policy as crazy unnecessarily expensive and that they should get on with reforming it. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I agree. That's why the next Labour government will deliver yeah. a modern childcare system from the end of parental leave to the end of primary school. Yeah. If even yeah. our own colleagues can see the case for change, why can't the Secretary of State? Yeah. 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 Well, I think uh, the Honourable Lady will find that when Labour were in power for 13 years, they did nothing on this issue. And actually, actually, it was the Conservative, it was the Conservative government who expanded the two-year-old offer and the three- and four-year-old offer for parents. And I would love to see the costings of her proposals because I think what she's proposing is yet more pie in the sky for parents. But we take this issue very seriously. And we're very committed to increasing the flexibility and affordability of childcare for parents in this country. Chloe Smith. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I welcome the Secretary of State's brief update just now on the SEND Green Paper. It's right to get the correct support to families and to young people as early as possible. But the Green Paper was also right to talk about a truly inclusive education system. What progress will the 9,000 young people in Norfolk with education, health and care plans see in 2023? Well, I thank the Honourable Lady, and I hope that the 9,000 children will see progress. Not only have we increased the overall funding by about 50% for SEND uh, since 2019, but we're increasing the number of specialist school places, and in the reforms that we're setting out, we'll be setting out national standards, which I hope will also improve their educational experience. SMP spokesperson, Carol Mollau. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And as a former teacher, I support the right of our teachers to strike and will oppose this government's anti-strike legislation. So does the Secretary of State agree that constructive dialogue with our dedicated teachers is vital, rather than demonising them as Bolsheviks and commies, as one of her colleagues has disgracefully done? Oh, I thank the Honourable Lady for a question. I always believe in constructive dialogue. I, uh, the very first meeting I took, as a, we welcomed in the new year, was with uh, all the four main teaching unions, and I will also be meeting them again later on this week. Peter no, no, Gibson. Thank you, Mr. If we are levelling up and trying to recruit and train more teachers in the North East, why on earth has the outstanding Carmel College in my constituency being stripped of its accreditation to train teachers by a tick box form filling exercise destroying 20 years of hard work and leaving the North East worse off. Well, I visited uh, Carmel College. I know what a good school uh, it is. Um, the ITT, the, the uh, ITT reforms are a key part of the government's commitment to levelling up and ensuring that high quality teachers are there for every child. Following an expert review, a robust uh, accreditation process was undertaken to, imp to approve 179 providers covering all regions, including the North East, and ICT provision is also expanding through the partnership. Now, I know my honourable friend Met, uh, discussed this with my predecessor, the honourable member for Stoke North, and I'd be happy to meet him again to discuss uh, my honourable friend's concerns. 
Steffi Pico. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And myself and the member for Barnsley Central last week held a meeting with parents about SEND provision. Barnsley has one of the highest numbers of EHC plans in the country. What resources will the government commit to ensure provision is improved where it is needed most? Yeah, yeah. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady and I can tell her that the high needs funding uh, for Barnsley increased 12% year on year for 2023 24, which will be over £40 million in total. They also received £7 million for high needs provision capital from 2023 to 2025 to increase the number of places as well. Mr. Mm-hmm. Speaker, I remind the House of my uh, uh, members' uh, uh, entry. I'm glad to hear that the Children's Social Care Review. response from the government is going to come out uh, shortly, and the government has set up an implementation board to progress its findings. Over 80% of children in care are in the care of the independent sector, and yet that implementation board has refused to allow any representative from the independent sector on that board. Why not? Uh, thank you, my honourable friend, for, for his... Um for his question. I'm committed to reform in children's social care across all sectors, and my right honourable friend, my honourable friend, the Minister for Children, Families and Wellbeing, has been working hard in partnership with the National Implementation Board and the wider sector to design a plan for reform that will introduce meaningful change for children and families. It is quite a small group, so we've uh, deliberately kept it small, but uh, I'll ask my uh, honourable friend to take a look and check that it's representative. Speaker. The number of PE teachers has fallen by nearly 3,000 in the last 10 years, and the number of hours of PE taught fallen by 36,000. With nearly a third of young people currently classed as inactive, what's the government going to do to stop physical activity flatlining and make sure that young people can get the benefits of social, physical, mm. mental benefits of, of PE in schools? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, we've met the target for PE teacher recruitment for, for most of the last uh, t- 10 years. Uh, and uh, we have the school action, uh, the school sport and action plan in place. Uh, there's a new plan being worked on at the moment. We take sport in schools uh, very seriously. It's important for, for both for physical health and mental health, and actually for academic attainment. Shimon Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Parents of children with special educational needs feel they are constantly battling to be heard, and so their children can lead, f- lead fulfilling lives. Um, some Stroud children are only getting a few hours of schooling each week, which is hugely, hugely um, uh, disruptive for family and child. So I'm working with Gloucestershire County Council's Phil Robinson to improve day-to-day experiences of Stroud families. But what is my right honourable friend doing to ensure that the local authorities and parents are, are, are really key to implementing the new reforms? Well, I thank my honourable lady. I am really exercised about this issue. I speak to parents of children with SEND all the time, and I do think they find the experience very adversarial. I will be setting out more details in the implementation strategy shortly, but this is something that I care very passionately about. Sean Hodgson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The current national school breakfast programme only reaches one quarter of the children living in areas with high levels of deprivation in England. Labour has set out our universal free breakfast offer, meaning no child is too hungry to learn. When will the government join the Labour Party in this commitment? We are spending uh, £30 million between 2021 and 2024 on the school breakfast programme. It offers free breakfast to children in disadvantaged areas, supporting their attainment and readiness to learn. Now, the focus of the breakfast provision has been to target the most disadvantaged areas of the country, and that has been our strategy. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, Does the Secretary of State think that it is uh, acceptable that four out of five dyslexic children still leave school not identified, and that teachers still do not have to be trained to support dyslexic children specifically. Uh, It was a pleasure to meet the Minister last week, but will she ensure that in future early intervention is put in place for the identification of dyslexia 
and other neurodivergent conditions. Here, here. Well, I thank uh, my right honourable friend and for his collaborative approach in the meeting that we had last week. I absolutely do think that early identification is key, and we'll be looking very carefully at that and teacher training in the implementation plan that I'll be setting out shortly. Uba. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On New Year's Eve, the care community lost a highly respected and dear friend and true advocate. Ian Dixon spent his entire life making a difference to children in care and urging governments to listen to them. The Care Review does not have all the answers, so will the Minister please implement the recommendations from the pioneering Care Experience Conference, for which Ian played a leading role in? Well, I thank my Honourable Lady, and I, I pay tribute to Ian's work, and I would love to, to look at that in more detail and, and speak to her further about what we can take forward. Paul Holmes. The latest for me was Chilton Academy and, and talking to them about their Go Well support. <coughs> and we all talk about funding, but the biggest thing that they hit with me with on funding is not just the amount, but it's also the visibility and the extended timelines that it's there. Can the Minister please explain what can be done to make sure that the schools know earlier and for longer what money they'll have available? Well, I understand and agree with my honourable friend about the importance of uh, certainty over funding. The dedicated school grant allocations for 23-24 were published in December 2022, including indicative allocations for the mainstream school's additional grant, which will distribute the additional £2 billion of funding uh, that was announced in the autumn statement. Lord Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've heard, the additional £15 million hardship for students announced last week amounts to less than £10 per head, uh, significantly less, according to my sums, while the IFS says that students are £1,500 a year worse off. Today, the APPG for Students is launching an inquiry into the impact of the cost of living crisis on students, inviting submissions from students, their unions and institutions across the UK. Will the Minister agree to meet with us to consider the evidence we receive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I, I would be delighted to, uh, to meet. 276 million, along with other measures the government done, including the energy rebates and other support that we try and give students who are facing cost of living challenges. So. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In light of the government's new emphasis on numeracy in schools, can I make a plea that the government does not forget about literacy in schools and, in particular, how we can continue to raise standards? I have an initiative called Get Whitton Reading, which has been running for 10 years now, and I would urge members of the front bench to come to Whitton to see that scheme in action this year to see how it's raised standards in education. Yeah. Well, I couldn't agree more with my right honourable friend, and I share her passion. I'd be delighted to come and see the scheme in place in, in, uh, in her constituency. We take reading very seriously. We have risen through the international league tables from joint 10th to joint 8th in the polls study, and it's the least able children who are improving fastest uh, in, in those surveys. My councillor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. James Kerfoot, the head teacher of Rudith Senior Academy, which serves constituents uh, of, of, of my patch, has introduced free school meals for all pupils. Why doesn't the Minister do the same? Yeah. Well, as I said, we're spending £1.6 billion each year on free school meals targeted at the, the most disadvantaged children. But of course, schools are able uh, to use their pupil premium funding, which is £2.5 billion a year to the schools if they wish to extend uh, the coverage of free school meals to more pupils. We did extend, as I've said earlier, free school meals to all pupils in infant schools, and that was a, an early decision of the coalition, uh, Conservative-led coalition government. Jerome Mayu. Mr. Children's Services in Norfolk have been judged as requiring improvement all the way back since 2008. So will my honourable friend join me in congratulating Executive Director Sarah Tuff and all her staff, as well as Councillor John Fisher, on last week's assessment that Norfolk's children's services are now good and well on their way to outstanding. Yeah. Um, I thank my honourable friend. I will indeed congratulate that team. It is, it is actually quite a hard thing to do, and I think it's brilliant that they've been able to get to that, that recommendation. Margaret Furrier. Mr Speaker, we take the safety of schools very seriously, the Minister's response to an earlier question. So, will Ministers reconsider mandating the fitting of sprinklers in new build schools to minimise the risk posed by fires to the buildings, equipment, pupils' schoolwork and the people within them? Well, the Honourable Lady will know that there is revised guidance to uh, the, the, build, the new building Buildings Bulletin has been uh, issued after a wide consultation and it does make some changes to the requirements for when sprinklers are to be installed in schools, particularly when the risk factor of the pupils, the students in the school is high. For example, 
children with special educational needs or residential schools. Final question, Nikki Aitken. Speaker, when I met with Jewish students studying in universities in my constituency, I was appalled to learn of the anti-Semitism that they have to suffer yeah. on a daily basis often. Um, and it was made worse by the recent report into the NUS, the National Uni Union of Students, handling and challenging of anti-Semitism. In the month where we mark Holocaust Memorial Day, I would be interested to hear the Minister's assessment of that NUS report. I thank my wife and friend uh, for, her, for her question. Uh, I've been shocked uh, and sobered by reading this report that NUS is in was in essence a hostile place for Jewish students. That's not acceptable. Um, NUS, National Union Student, the main body for students, should be a place that isn't just safe, but a place that is welcoming for Jewish students as well. And uh, the proof of the pudding of this report will be in the eating. I expect to see uh, the changes and the recommendations implemented in full. And once that has occurred, then I will uh, re-engage uh, with the National Union of Students. Right, that completes questions. We're now going to go on to the statement. I'll let the house clear. 